so I will talk about the materials that people like Fabian and I are working with, interaction designers, engineers, and developers, when, when building interactive systems. Uh, I will talk about digitals, uh, and how digitals, in a way, set the design material for us as interaction designers and developers within this field, and how they need to be thought of as design materials, pretty much like how paper, wood, and concrete are materials to us. But also we need to consider how digitals are uh, dynamic and not static materials. So when I say digitals, I mean hardware and software, anything that sort of potentially affects the user experience a user might have with some interactive system. I refer to artifacts such as the computer or the mobile phone or even some toolkit with sensors and actuators that aren't even the mobile phone anymore. I refer to circuit boards that are within those artifacts and the components on those circuit boards, such as accelerometers, sensors, actuators, whatever, consistors, but also even the soldering that sort of connects those components to the circuit boards might affect some user experience if you're going to design something so fine-tuned as, as the work that uh, we've heard about before, the hand interactions and so on. And I'm even referring to the in-between, the radio, the wireless in between these artifacts, and even the programming languages sometimes affect the user experience. So, digitals are hard to work with. I'm an engineer in my background, and in engineering school, we are taught to plan ahead. We are taught not to build before we know what we're going to build. We're taught to sketch our system, do a flow chart, and then set off building what we have planned for. This while designers are taught to open up, explore their materials and develop their idea together with the material, discover the material properties that can expand on their idea. Uh, they are taught to explore their materials so that they can push what is possible. Some, at some point, someone learned how to put wood in water and discovered how it's then bendable and ah, then we can do new things with this material. Uh, and this is while we, as uh, interaction designers, uh, we stem from the engineering tradition. Interaction design is still a pretty new design field. And we are taught, as we're working with digitals, to plan our work before we start to build. We are not taught to explore like textile designers or even architects uh, or, or some other designer. This leads to us very often end up fighting our materials. This often leads to uh, you getting buggy systems in your hands because we are taught to just build something. Uh, this also leads to the mobile phone being squared all the time because we are taught that the screen is square and then we work with the screen being square. We don't really sit down and explore the materials we, we are working with. So this is a system I built as a newly appointed PhD student in 2003, also uh, exploring physicality and, and body language. This is the Emoto system. Uh, it was a system, um, you look skeptical, it was in 2003. <laughs> it was a system that, because at that time we wrote text messages to each other, digital communication didn't allow for very much of body language. And body language sets a whole lot of the communication we have in between people. So as design research, we wanted to explore how can we design for more of body language in digital communication. And um, I, I was uh, appointed to build something in this direction together with a designer, a graphics designer uh, called Anna Stoll. Uh, and being a pretty regular graphics designer and a pretty regular engineer, uh, we, we set out to build this system. 
Uh, so, being pretty regular, we are taught to sort of plan our work. We went out to users, listened for what they wanted in the direction of body language in digital communication. We did personas, sketched on whoever are we directing this uh, system to, and we did user scenarios. So, in pretty regular brainstorming sessions, we came to the idea of the Emoto system. Emoto system would then allow a user to feel more of the emotion he or she wanted to communicate. So the interaction we thought of was that the user would open her phone and see a pretty neutral screen, and then she would write her or he write her text message, his text message, and then do the gesturing, and the phone would answer to those emotional gestures. We wanted to move away from smileys that were really popular at the time. We wanted to allow for something personal. We wanted not to squeeze everyone down to one expression. We wanted everyone to be uh, free to choose whatever expression they wanted for happiness, for example. And at that time, uh, phones had sort of these little sticks, uh, stylus pens. And we thought that we could extend uh, such stylus pen with an accelerometer and a pressure sensor to um, allow a user to press the pen really hard and shake it when wanted to communicate something aggressive, or sort of fiddle around with it a bit lighter when wanting to express something more joyful. Because we also looked at body language and we found that people get more tense when wanting to express something negative. So we thought like, oh, we can, we can pick up on that and, and have that as an underlying basis to go, let people go in a certain direction for expressions similar to anger, for example and then let people choose. So in the background of this system, we thought of a two-dimensional model combining pressure and movement to let people express their emotions. And we built that system, uh, and it was weird then. It's still a bit weird. It's uh, still valid as a research contribution, though. We haven't really got to this point yet, so we were good research designers in that we were far ahead. We are going in this direction. We see more and more physicality in computer interaction today. Just think about the Kinect and all the sports applications we have. We did something wrong, though, because being a pretty regular engineer, I wanted to behave well and save battery power. So therefore, I made sure that we just had the Bluetooth connection between the pen and the phone on when it was about to be used. That ended up destroying the whole feel of the system. The system worked, as I told you before. You could send those messages, you could do the gesturing and everything like that. But what happened was that when you did your gestures, you did like angry gesture, nothing happened. You did the angry gesture. You did the angry gesture. You did something less angry. And then the system answered. Uh, so. By doing it that way, we sort of lost the engagement of our users. The system worked, but we lost the engagement they built up doing the gestures in the first place. What we should have been doing was, of course, to explore Bluetooth. We should have got to know the potential materials that we were about to work with. And thinking of Bluetooth from a more designerly point of view, Bluetooth is a 40 meters in diameter big square. It would fill this room. And thinking about it that way, you know, you can get a whole lot of thoughts on systems feeding off being inside and outside such square. Uh, and in my lab, uh, we are designers and engineers, HI specialists, psychologists, whatever. And we need to work together. We need to understand our design material that we're all working with, whoever we are, because even the psychologists, even though they're not building the system, are part of the system design. And we all need to come together and understand digitals. And this is why we have in my team, we have what we call the inspirational bits. And these are some interaction designers uh, <laughs> playing with an inspirational bit, teaching them how Bluetooth works. <laughs> so we have these kinds of bits in various Where's materials, and here? here they're running around. There is this blue pea jumping between their phones. How do they have it? Oh, you got one! Oh, shit! <laughs> 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 we thought we were stuck. 
so well hidden. Yeah, you can always go to the ladies' room later. <laughs> So the joy here actually helps because they're having fun together and afterwards we can sit down and discuss what they actually did. What they can learn from something like this, they can learn the joy of a boring stiff technology like Bluetooth, uh, but they can also learn that Bluetooth doesn't see walls and floors the way we as humans do. They can learn the reach of Bluetooth and how it changes with the human body and so forth. It doesn't help to run into the ladies' room, for example. But it can also open up their imagination for, cool, we could build systems that sort of have something jump through the floor to the second ground here or something. That would be cool. So we can open up for a material discussion within the theme that hasn't been possible before. Uh, but it's also important to understand that Bluetooth or any radio technology, here it's sensor nodes, uh, they don't really form a perfectly round square. Because if we allow for such imagination, we, we build up for the wrong expectations on technologies. So here you have interaction designers walking around with a sensor node that is attached to another sensor node. So what you see on the screen here is the radio signal strength between two sensor nodes. And by doing it this way, they can walk around and see, OK, so when I come closer, I see that the signal is stronger. It's also more stable. I can see that it disappears behind my back. I can also see that it fluctuates. And that is something I need to count for in my design. Bluetooth or any radio technology today uh, fluctuates. And it's not really something that we think we will solve tomorrow. Uh, it will continue to fluctuate. Per technologies aren't these perfect things uh, that we tend to think about. And we need to uh, sort of count for that in our designs, because we will design better then. But it's not only about discovering limitations. It's also about discovering possibilities. So here are a few interaction designers playing with accelerometers and discovering how they are super, super good at comparing movement and how they are moved in space. So if she dances here in front of them, they can dance in the back, and then the accelerometer can tell down to the data bit uh, how close they were to the leader in front of them. And that is really good information because accelerometers tend to be used to capture movement, but they actually don't capture movement, and the word tell us that. We should know that. Because a movement like this is just caught here to the end, or to the start and the end. Then in the middle, it's the same movement, and it doesn't accelerate. Then nothing is captured. So they don't capture movement. We shouldn't go that way when designing with accelerometers. We should go for comparisons. You can move one device and then another, and that way you can capture movement, for example. So you need to come to understand your design materials. And this is pretty much the way any designer work with their materials. But we need to come to understand that digitals also are materials, and even radio is a material. And this is why paper prototyping doesn't work anymore. You know, because it's not just about traditional mobile phones. Now we're heading into this, everyone is, it's the buzzword, the Internet of Things society. But we really are, actually. We've been talking about this society for 10 plus years, and it's been a wet dream, connecting all devices around and so on. But now we have the technical glue, the internet, to make this possible. But then we need to understand, because now it's just not just stable things in our hands anymore. Thank you.